right, last time um, I was talking about um, strategies for learning and I made the uh, contention that telling kids to learn something is not a strategy for learning. I will now give you what is perhaps an example of what is perhaps the worst non-strategy disguised as the strategy for attempting to teach kids something. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get up, ready? And I'm gonna pick on someone, here we go. This is our poor sixth grader. Jennifer. Jennifer, we all remember Jennifer, right? This is right when she was in second grade, now sixth grade. And Jennifer can't multiply. She's been trying since fourth grade to multiply. These are my flashcards. <laughs> Jennifer, multiply this. Multiply this. Six times seven, how much? Say 41. 41. Okay, let's try it again. Oh, it's 42. Multiply this. Nine times nine. Seven. There you go. Now give her right one. Seven times seven. 49. Oh, good. Now we go through again. She got them wrong. Well, I got to do it again. Do it like this. Do this. This time she's got nine times nine. I'm missing seven times seven. Everybody's been a teacher will tell you that. That's not teaching. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. You can't do it. It's not working. Do it again. Did I tell you the call about the mother in the barbecue pit? I don't think so. I'm, I was working in a clinic. Uh, and I get a call and there's some woman uh, calls with her her child and who is uh, 15, 14, something like that. Anyway, she calls and the kid was having problems, but she also said she has big problems with multiplication. Oh, education, get it to Lieberman, he's the ed guy. So, calls me up, she's having a fight with her daughter. What's the fight? The daughter has been trying to multiply, doing multiplication tables since the fourth grade. It's the seventh grade now, and she's had flashcards since the fourth grade, and she's in the seventh grade. And I believe this was spring break, so we're well into the seventh grade. And she's having her fight with her daughter about whether or not to take the flashcards on the vacation they're going to go on. And the daughter is upset and fears she won't go, and she's still got to take, got to keep practicing. So I said to her, ma'am, how does your daughter do it? How long has your daughter had these flashcards? Oh, since the fourth grade. I said, can she multiply? She said, no, not very well. So, so she's had the cards about three years? She said, yes. I said, how many years will she have to have the cards before you draw the conclusion that they're not working? <laughs> so I hear this like stunned pause at the other end of the phone. She said, well, 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 what should I do with them? I said, you have a uh, barbecue, barbecue outside? You have one of those? She said, yeah, yeah, we live in a house, we have one of those. I said, why don't you take them out, throw them to barbecue, and let your daughter burn them? She said, really? I said, what do you got to lose? They're not teaching her how to multiply. The next day she calls me back. She said, I want to thank you. She said, I don't know if you can teach my daughter to multiply or not, but I haven't seen her ha as this happy since, you know, in four years, right? So she brought it down. I taught her how to multiply. I'm going to show you now how I taught a seventh grader to multiply. Okay, I will now make this statement publicly, I believe for the second time in this course, with the exception of one child who was born, born with um, uh, a genetic chromosomal problem who basically was functioning um, like a five or a six year old. Um, I have never failed to teach an adolescent how to multiply, okay? But even though I know what's going on with adolescents and know how they think, I, always, I almost always do the following. Okay, let's go to the tablet. Let me see if I've got a... Let 
I say, which one of these is the same as six times six? Now, I've worked with third graders, too. Oh, we got to do it earlier. Multiply, multiply. Oh, let's do it in kindergarten. Oh, let's do multiplication and, you know, oh, let's broadcast them in utero, right? We'll get to that. You think I'm kidding? I'm not. I'm not kidding. And when the kid tells me it's this one, then I know I'm okay. Kid understands the logic of multiplication. Okay. By the way, that little girl said to me, she must have been 13 or 14, but I said she had, you know, severe problems. She said to me, what do you mean? This is plus, this is times. What does one have to do with the other, right? I have to memorize my facts, okay? All right, so come back to me. So I, I say, no, no, no. I said, okay, I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, I'm assuming, and this is a segue to some extent into Piaget, I'm assuming that this child now has the cognitive capacity of, of a 13 or 14-year-old, which would be 14-year-old, which would be concrete operational. We'll get to that and probably set of formal operations. Almost all the kids, I would say just about everyone I've, been, I've done this with, I've done this with lots and lots of kids, know the ones, know the twos, and know the fives. Right? And they know that 8 times 2 is 8 plus 8, which is 16. The fives, even though they may know it by heart, I'll say 5 times 8, they go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. Right? By the way, if you're going to teach elementary kids, these are very good tools. Here's what you say, have. Here's a kid, you say, how much is 6 plus 2? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, plus 2, another 2, 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 8. Don't use your fingers. Yeah, but I can't get the right answer without my fingers. Don't use your fingers. You've got something that'll get you the right answer, don't use it. <laughs> what kind of business is that? Do you really think that that seven-year-old is gonna be using her fingers to add six plus two when she's 27? Give me a break. You've gotta stop using your fingers by a given day. Really? Got into big troubles with my kid, right? My, before, I told you I have two kids and two of them. I picked, along, I picked up along with them. Before my wife and I got married, she had her kids in a uh, parochial school. She was parochial school. And they said, all the kids have to learn to stop using their fingers by Passover, right? A Jewish holiday that comes in spring. But it comes on the Jewish calendar, which is a lunar calendar and is fixed up right, with a leap month. So sometimes it comes early in the spring, sometimes later, right? So my wife said to them, well, she said, well, gee, this year it comes a little earlier than last year. Can my kid have another two weeks? They got that she was being sarcastic, right? I mean, please, give me a break here. Setting dates got to be by this time, and it's got to be, don't use your fingers. Fingers are wonderful for elementary school kids. You got to be careful, though, because they can use them 3 plus 4, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7. But if he gets 5 plus 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, they run out of fingers. I'll show you later how I did that. Anyway, so here's what I do. They almost know, all know the 1s and the 5s. So I say to them, the 1s, the 2s, and the 5s. Even if they have to use their fingers for them. Most of them don't, right? They use their fingers. But even if they do, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 35 times 6 is 30, okay? They get it. So I said, okay. You know the ones and the twos, just add them up to make the threes. Let me tell you right now that this is not so hot with third and fourth graders. Even though they'll tell you that seven times three is seven plus seven plus seven, the mental facility to say, oh, ones and twos make threes, many of them don't catch on. That's one of the problems with information processing theory. It will tell you the short-term memory is small. The, the amount you can keep in your working memory, I learned stuff a long time ago, so I still say short-term, okay? The amount of it is, is seven plus or minus two. Less for children, but can't tell you why. They really have no sense of why children, strategies that work great for a 16-year-old are useless to a six-year-old. They say, well, try it. If it doesn't work, try another one. That, in general, seems to be the approach of learning theories. But in any case, so here's what I tell them. So let's go back to the tablet. So I've said if you have seven times three, Right? Do 7 times 2, 7 to 7 is 14, and 7 times 1, 7, and then add 14 plus 7, 
seven. Use your fingers, eight, nine, 10, 11, one, 21, okay? That's what they'll tell you. That's what they do, okay? Eventually, I'll show you what happens. I'll show you the stages that I've noticed on stages. But eventually, it goes to this. Seven times two is 14. Well, I'll show you with the fours, okay? I'll show you with the fours. So when you go, seven, nine, 10, 11, 21, okay? I tell them the fours. Here, let me show you the fours. Okay, eight times four, I said it's eight times two plus eight times two, right? So you go eight times two. Now, this doesn't happen in one day. You have to practice. It's 16, and eight times two is 16. 16 plus 16 is six. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Okay, thirty-two. Okay, this I usually can do. Okay. <laughs> what happens, it usually goes from this to this. 8 times 2 is 16, 8 times 2 is 16, and then instead of doing this, they just put this 16 under here and go and add it up to 32. Eventually you get this, 8 times 2 is 16, plus another 16 is 32. I'll carry the 1, 32, okay? Takes a while, but that's what I knew is the progress of how they do it. Okay, you got it? Come back to me now. The fives we know, the sixes, and this is not a scientific study, but from what I have seen from kids, it's the one that drives kids the most nuts. So that's the easiest one. Just take the fives and the ones and add them up. I had one kid just like that. He got in his head. He said, oh, yeah, six times seven. Five times seven is 35. Three, six is seven to eight, three, nine, 40. Six times seven is 40. Five times seven is 35. Is that right? So six times seven is five, six, seven to eight, nine. 42, right? And eventually got in his head, right? You understand what I'm saying? So if you, let's go to the tablet. So if you have it, um, uh, seven times six, you go seven times five. It is five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, okay. And seven times one is seven, and you have 35 and seven. Most kids are just bringing. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, carry the 142. Right? Go ahead. But don't you think, like, by learning the sixes that way, when it's time, like, six times four, for example, when it's time to learn the fours, and they do four times six, that means that they would have to learn a whole new way of memorizing four times six versus six times four? You know, that's a good question. As a matter of fact, it's a great question. Um, the answer is it doesn't bother teenagers. <coughs> It can bother young kids. Most of them are aware. It can bother third and fourth graders, I think, right? Most of them are aware that six times four and four times six is the same, okay? As a matter of fact, I've had some kids, I get here six times four, that's a very good question, and um, they start with a four, six times two. I said, don't you want to use the sixes? Oh, yeah, I didn't realize I could use either one. And eventually I get one kid and they'll go, you know, uh, um, they'll go, gee, let me see which one I want to use. But you're right. There, there has to be an understanding. And all, I did have a couple of kids who I would get this, they preferred the six, and they would go and they would switch it to this because they like the six one, okay? And it's to be easy. But you're right. It takes a while. You'll have some kids that doesn't. Most kids who are middle school kids, it won't confuse at all. But some, it will. But eventually, they tend to get it. You have to watch and see what's working and what doesn't. OK? Now, I have to show you one more thing. <coughs> Nines. OK, get back to me. Come back to me. OK. How many people know, by the way, don't call it tricks, call it strategies. I had one kid once told me, I don't like tricks, I wanna really know it. So after that, instead of saying it's a five, it's a nine's trick, I call it the nine's strategy, or the six's trick, I call it the six's strategy. Who knows the nine's strategy? Who knows one? Okay, what one do you know? Go ahead. Oh, I don't know how to explain it, but like nine times two, you subtract one from the two. And okay, okay, we'll get to that one. Line. Okay, we're going to tell me your name. Put it down. 
Rebecca. Okay, Rebecca's going to walk us through that one. Who knows, who knows another one with the columns? Go ahead. Push it down, push it down. You know the one with the fingers? Yeah. All right, come up here. Don't volunteer. Was anybody in the Army? I, you notice his head never goes up. I was in the Army. I never volunteer for anything. Right? Am I right? Never volunteer. Okay, let's get it. Turn around, turn around. Okay, Rebecca, no, turn around the other way, Rebecca. Okay. No, no, like this so they can see your hands. Oh, God. Go ahead. Hold them up. Okay, hold them up, hold them up. Okay, Rebecca, show us nine times six. She put down the six feet finger, and the answer is? 54. See? Everything on, here's the down finger, the thumb. Say it, it's down. So everything on the side of the down finger is the first number, 50, then four. Okay, nine times seven. Go ahead, Rebecca. No, no, no you got to count for us. Go ahead. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven, so the answer is? Go ahead. Uh, six, three. six, six here and three. Now, obviously, with teenagers, you know what's going to happen. Go ahead, nine times three. One, two, three. Oh, there's the magic finger. <laughs> All right, so they'll giggle a couple times. So what? Okay, and you get? Uh, 27. You see how she got the 27? Two on this side of the finger, that's 20, and seven on this side of the finger is 27. Okay. Thank you very much. Give her a big hand. Okay, that works. Okay, one, okay, one of the, come back to, I didn't give her a microphone, but you saw how it worked, okay? One of the, very good. Okay, there's another one that has columns. How does that, anybody know that column one? How does it work? Put that, push it down, push it down. Tell me what to do. Let's go to the tablet. Tell me what to do. One, two, three, four, five? Yeah. One, two, three. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Wait, let me make this a five. Five, okay, and then I do the same, eight, nine, I do the same thing here? Yeah. The zero here? Here? Yeah. Zero, one, oh, two, three, four. Oh, you see it? Five, six, seven, eight, Nine. So, okay, now, so now what do I do? This confuses me so much, I don't know what's going on. Okay. Okay, so the top one is, they all add up to nine. So zero plus nine is nine, one plus eight is nine. You see, you see these all add up to nine. Across here, they all add up to nine. Right. Okay, I got you. Now, how do I know what the answer is? Okay, so nine times one is nine. So you start. Huh? Okay. <laughs> <I can't remember. laughs> I, okay. One, two, Someone three, help me, please. Five. Oh, I see. So I count one, two, three, four, five. Five times nine is forty. Five. Go ahead, push it down. If it's nine times five, you look at the five on the left, and you go to the number set above it, and it's forty-five. Nine times six see. is fifty-four. Nine times yeah. seven is sixty-three. Okay. Thank you very much. As you can tell, this strategy doesn't work for me. Okay. Let me tell you something about this strategy. I've used this strategy. So, so 9 times 8 would be 72, right? I see. <coughs> nine, 9 times 0. Yeah, they know that. Okay? I never use it. This strategy from my, from my uh, uh, work with lots of kids never works. Except... When it does, that's the problem. I had one kid I couldn't believe. This drives me nuts. One kid who preferred this one. Okay, I'm going to show you the third one now. This is the one that older kids tend to like the best. By the way, come back to me for a second. One, you must always be careful. You must always be careful. And this theory does have almost no room for emotion but the emotions of the kids. If you're working with older kids or even with a kid in the fifth grade, Okay, and all the other kids can go, seven times seven is 49, and six times six is, how much is that? 32, I don't know. I have a calculator, I don't worry. Six times six is 36, blah, blah, blah. This kid may be embarrassed to use his fingers. Today's a heat day, right? His or her fingers. So if kids, re I've had more than one kid tell me, I don't want to use my fingers. 
right? Matter of fact, the older they are, four, you know, if I get a 14, 15 year old, they say, fingers in, or, or they're down like this, right? Not looking where my hands are. So here's the one. Who was the one who knew the, the first person to tell me? Oh, here we go. All right, watch this one. Ready? Here's the next one. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Let's take 9 times 7. Okay. You subtract 1 from the number you're multiplying. Okay, what's 1 less than 7? Less than 7 is 6, and then whatever it takes to add a 9. So, so six, 6 plus 3 is 9. Oh, so 6, six plus how much is 9 is 3. So 9 times 9, 1 less is? 8, and then plus 1 is 9. Okay. How many people were not, let me see if I can go up here. Wait, one more. I should be able to get up one more. There. What's happening here? Let's just do it this way. How many people were not aware of the fact that all the nines times tables add up to nine? Who was not aware of that? Raise your hand. Yeah, I got about five, six people in here. Those of you watching by other means, I bet there are a bunch of you too. In my opinion, let your teacher sue me, that's educational negligence. You should not have been able to get through school without knowing that. Okay. This last one that I did, first of all, it's easier. Okay. Let me just show you back here. This one is more difficult than this one because you got to write them all down, right? And again, it can be embarrassing to kids to have that little gizmo next to them. This one, it's, it's you know, and it looks like you know, right? Nine times six is 54. Even though I did six, seven, wait, did you hear me count five, six, seven, eight, nine in my head? You didn't do that, right? Five, six, seven, eight. You can hardly tell. It looks like you know it, like you have it memorized. Okay, interestingly enough, come back to me for a second. Interestingly enough, what information processing people are going to tell you is that everyone had a strategy, a mnemonic, if you will, a, a, a way to remember them. But then automaticity sets in and you don't remember how you remembered. You often remember if you, it was a pain in the neck, like how do you spell desert and dessert? Of course, Desert, like the soldier deserted from the army, that's back to D-E-S-E-R-T -E to one S. But okay, never mind. Okay, how did you spell this word, that word, the other word, right? For instance, how many people learn to spell the word conscience by remembering it's conscience? You know it, right? So that you remember because it's an impossible word. Here, let me see this. Let me see, let's go back to the tablet. Conscience. 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 Who can remember? Sound it out. Well, this is what I get, right? I mean, come on, will you please? So, when there are difficult words, come back to me for a second, wait, they drive you nuts. You say, okay, you remember them. But words like dog and cat and ball and hat and banana and fur and all this, you don't remember. But they were there, they're going to tell you. Okay, back to my multiplication. Right now, I have everything done. I have everything done except by knowing, by knowing the ones through the sixes and the nines, you now, although, tell, tell me your name about the upside down. Tell me your name. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. Yeah. Michelle. Except for Michelle's objection, that you have to be sure the kid knows that seven times six and six times seven are the same. So if you have seven six times seven, you can use the seven times six strategy, right? As I said, it's usually you got to be sure about that and explain it to them and work with them a little on it. You can even practice turning around sometimes if you need to. I now have everything done except seven times seven, seven times eight, and eight times eight. All the rest are covered. Okay, now let me tell you, show you this. If you do 8 times 7, let's go to the tablet, that's easy. 5, 6, 7, 8. How hard is that, right? 
By the way, I didn't notice this until I was teaching this. I didn't <laughs> So I'm in the clinic and I'm being, I'm looking through this and somebody hears me and said, you idiot, look at this, right? He had learned it when he was in school. Interestingly enough, this is not as easy as you think because this is between you and me an idiot's trick. Up through the sixes, it's all based on logic. Take twos and twos and make them fours. Take fives and ones and add them up and it becomes a six. Okay? So the kid go, you know, some kid goes a nine, it goes a seven times six, uh, four, five, six, seven. No, that's the wrong one. It's this one, right? So it's sometimes, okay? Eight times seven, most kids can get it by t saying take eight times five and eight times two. Okay, this is 40 and this is 16 and 56, right? Most kids can get it that way. You have to practice that a little. Eight times eight, I don't know what to tell you. I just learned this, I admit to you. Who knows the poem? I learned it last year. I've been doing this. Eight times eight fell on the floor. They got up. And 64, when they got up, there were 64, something like that. I tried it once. Kid goes, eight times eight fell on the floor. They got up. How much was it, 54? <laughs> if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. All right, I'm going to make an admission to you. Come back to me. I want a full picture while I admission mid things. What I tell the kid to do is write eight times eight on your hand. Eight times eight is 64 on the inside of their hands. <laughs> Go like this, right? Then open it up three times, eight times, not 25 times because you, you get the, you know, this thing behind your ear. You get the, the, or you get the, what do you call it, effect. We talked about that, right? The getting tired effect, right? Fatigue effect. There, I knew I knew the word. The fatigue effect. I said, just do it every period. When you're walking in class or at the end of every period, go like this three times. That's what I, I don't know. I had one kid, he said, oh, I've got it. I do nine times eight and subtract an eight. That's pretty good. I tried another kid. Huh? Right? That's, that, was, that was a kid who was already right. Even quickly. Or I used to try eight times five, eight times two, and eight times one and add them up. By the time you get to the one, the kid's so confused, the numbers sprawl all over the page. You know what's going on. Worked with one kid. But you can see the point. This is a strategy for learning. Okay. I have to tell you one other thing. Okay. One other thing that's very, very important with strategies. Don't, don't come on the PowerPoint. I just wanted to see if I, I probably didn't put it in here. Oops. Obviously not. One thing that's very important with strategies is that you have to remember that although your job ultimately is to make a kid is to show kids strategies, is to show kids strategies, it is not, your ultimate job is to make them strategy makers. If a strategy is not working, stop, even though it worked great for you. Try to find another one. And if a kid has a strategy, you may find you don't like it. I'm gonna show you that what happened to me once. I'm in the clinic and we have the word together. This kid, this is the one who spelled against like this. Right? Same kid. I showed you that one, right? This kid couldn't spell. I said, spell together, he goes like this. I said, how'd you do that? He says, I go to get her, and when I get her, we're together. Pretty good, huh? Now, someone had shown him, obviously. Come back to me for a second. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. Of course, I didn't say anything, but it bothered me. <laughs> so I began to pilfer. I have to tell you, by the way, that strategies, I used to go and try to sit in a chair and try to remember back strategies I had because I'm a good speller. And so I've forgotten a lot of the strategies. It's become automatic to me, automaticity. I would take other people who were good spellers. That didn't work too hot. Then I would take people who had trouble spelling and say, can you give me a strategy that you would use for words that were hard for you? 
and I get one here and one there. Sometimes I get a principal coming out. Sometimes I take good spellers and I sit on them and say, I'm not going to get up till you give me one strategy, try to remember for a word. I threaten them with something. I don't know. But eventually I got a, a, a list of strategies. This won't bother me. But I sat down and I began to think through my own strategies and I began to real, realize why. Every strategy that I ever used for a word went by syllables. To me, you have to remember together syllables. And I even remembered why. Because that, and I've got to tell you this now, that is the perfect strategy for knowing when, to do, when there's a double letter and when there's not. You understand what I'm saying? Dissimilar is dissimilar. The, the, the consonant, the, the, the syllable always breaks between the double word, between the double letter. The syllable breaks between the double letter. So if you learn syllable by syllable, you'll never have problems with double letters. And, I, and I, I, that when it wasn't too hard for me to remember because I used to have a lot of trouble with that when I started spelling. Now I never do. Okay, and I remember how I spelled the word incandescent. You know what incandescent is? A fluorescent light bulb. Those long ones that we have on the ceiling in here. Incandescent is a light bulb you screw in and it goes pop and burns out and you gotta screw it in again, right? And here's how incandescent is spelled. Come up, let's come and tell them. And you see here, s one sound, but it's incandescent. I can't get this to erase. There we go. It's probably no better now. And this is how I remembered it. In, can, des, sent a penny. That's how I remembered it. And the, s, the two s sounds came through. By the way, when I learned how to spell this word, we didn't have circuit breakers. He had fuses. Right? And when you come back to me, and when you overloaded the, the uh, you know, a, a particular outlet, it just, you didn't have a, oh, pop, the circuit breaker pops, you go put it, a fuse burned out. You had to go down and unscrew it and put in a new fuse, and oh, no, I don't have fuses. So one way to get the fuse to work had it burned out was to stick a cent, a penny behind it, because it's copper, it conducts electricity pretty well, right? And you screw it back in again, and if you're lucky, the house won't burn down, right? <laughs> the thing burned out for a reason, it's overloaded. Cut it out, right? So, not supposed to do that. There are big, big warnings, do not screw pennies in behind your burned out swing, right? <laughs> Fuses. The fire department's too busy as it is, right? So I remembered a scent. It was easy to remember something to do with electricity with a scent. I see my father do it more times than, I, <laughs> than he should have, okay? So, of course, he was always, would unplug whatever made him blow out, right? You can almost immediately put down the toast, boom, the whole thing went, right? You know that. <laughs> and here now you just go out and you flick the circuit breaker, but in those time days. So that's how I would do it. I didn't say a word to him. That is a good strategy to go syllable by syllable, by the way. You also have to be, understand that kids can do this. Let me now give you one of the earliest poems that you remembered, that you ever memorized, and you had absolutely no idea what it meant. I before E, except after C, or when sounded as A, and neighbor and way. Right? I still remember the teacher showing me, I before E, except after C. Let's go back to the tablet, right? And she said, C, so it's after a C, so receive is E-I, not I-E. <laughs> that I can. One day, I must have learned that in third, third grade, fourth grade. Now, I before me, exam, da, 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 da. So I'm spelling the word foreign. No, that's an exception. I'm spelling the word, uh, um, what's a word that's neighbor and way? Uh, what's another one that has an E and I? There. What? There. But it doesn't sound like an A. <laughs> anyway, let's say it was way, and I spelled it like this. 
So the teacher says, no, I before is E, except that when sounded as A, way, and neighbor went. This was seventh grade. I still remember it was Miss Morgan. I said, oh, that's what that means, right? <laughs> oh, now I get it. By the way, there are a lot of exceptions to this. Somebody said, there, there, the E's before the I, and it doesn't sound like an A. And foreign, the E's before the I, and it doesn't sound like an A. But so all the rules, there are exceptions. All of you are aware of the fact, you know, they, they give you funny stuff like, oh, you know, how do you spell fish? You know, well, it's T-I for the sh in shun, right? Come on, will you please? Or the fish is like this, P-H-I-T-I, -I. right? P-H is for, is sh like shun. But everybody knows that shun at the uh, the only time T-I is shun is T-I-O-N at the end. And when you hear shun at the end, you put T-I-O-N. What are you, dope? So here, man, shun. Oh, I don't think that's right. They're supposed to, it's supposed to be, and this is wrong. There's supposed to be an S there. How come? I don't know. Just shut up and write it. I don't know. <laughs> what can I tell you? There are always exceptions. English is a brutally difficult language to spell. I wrote away. There's a, I don't know. I, I wrote away. I tried again. I don't have it come back to me. There's an episode I just saw a rerun of I Love Lucy. You all know what I Love Lucy is, right? And, and there, it's one of the episodes where Lucy is pregnant. And so she decides that she doesn't like the way Ricky talks English, and their child is going to speak perfect English. So he says, what are you talking about, right? I can read English. She's so giving the book, says, okay, read it, right? And he's got this thick Spanish accent. By the way, my guess is that he has voice coaches to practice that accent so it wouldn't drift into an American type accent, right? Because it was a very, you know, good Spanish accent, very, you know, clear, uh, he was from Cuba, <coughs> her, her husband. So he, He's reading the, okay, there was a, a woodsman who is a very tall person. <coughs> a lumberjack is a very tall person. He says, what, tall, tall? He says, tall, T-O-U-G-H, tall. He says, no, tough, tough. He says, oh, okay. Okay, so then he keeps reading. I can't do his accent. But he said, the woodsman went into the tree and chopped the buff off the tree. She said, buff? Let me look. B-O-U-G-H. T-O-U-G-H. B-O-U-G-H is buff. She said, no, that's bow. Bow, right? He says, oh, okay, bow. After he chopped off the bow, he went throughout the woods, right? <laughs> no, no, that's true. I mean, it's just, but I mean, they were professional actors. And <laughs> just a Hysterical, right? They were, it was just a riot. I, I, don't, I probably couldn't get it. I, I, I'll put something away if I run it. I'm sure it's copyrighted. And I, right now, I've only written a way to whatever channel we ran. I don't even remember. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm not going to be able to get it, but it is hysterical. So it's hard to know. How do you remember that it's through here? You take tough here. This is though. Oh, this is another one. He decided, and but this is this is not throw. This is through. I mean, come on, will you please? This is through too. <laughs> By the way, sound it out. Do you sound out bow or bow? Do you sound out wound or wind? Do you, wound or wound? Do you sound out wind or wind? Come on, will you? It's tough. Come back to me. So you're going to have to remember all of that. By the way. Just in case you're interested, come back here. This is also wind. We wind and dined them, right? All right, so come back. All right, so come back to me. So you're going to have to remember. You're going to have to give them tricks, uh, uh, strategies other than sounding out. You're going to have to be patient. And you're going to have to be aware of the limitations of strategies based on personality and on age. That, those strategies I told you for multiplication are very difficult for younger children, which requires a cognitive sophistication that they don't have yet, and something that information processing people don't talk about very much. Okay? But let's go back to the PowerPoint. 
But one thing that we do know, that research indicates that successful students are good at making and using strategies. Not just copying them from you, the teacher, but at making them. And poor learners are not good at making them. Okay? And come back to me for a second. Well, or get my picture in the corner if you can. One of the reasons when the, the teacher was smart, when I, remember I showed you about instead of making three tens and a six, I made four nines to make a 36. That teacher understood that I was making up my own strategies already. And that's better than copying hers. Furthermore, telling students to go home, I already told you this, good teachers show children how to learn, how to be, how to learn, and eventually how to become effective strategy makers on their own. Use your own strategies. I remember when I, I, I was in, I studied for a year in Israel between high school and college. And I had a little notebook in my pocket. And people would give me, when I heard a word I didn't know, I would write the word in Hebrew and then write it down in English. I had a little notebook in my pocket and I'd write it down. And I would flip through the notebook. One time I did this, right? I would ask people what it meant. There were, I, would, I was working with somebody either, who knew English well and finally couldn't stand it anymore. Right? I was, this was a work study program, so I'm working in the fields and he says, this is the fourth time I've told you that word. I'm not telling you again. He's screaming at me in English and he said, no, it's not. No, it's not. He said, give me that note. He grabs it out of my hand. Sure enough, he turns to the three other times I'd written it down. He was so angry. It's not a very effective strategy, just writing and memorizing. He said, figure out some way to remember it. He was a psychologist, but he was right. Okay. And finally, whoops, sorry about all this mess. Here we go. They're going to say that the most effective learners have a process they call, that they call metacognition. Cognition about cognition, that's what the word meta means. A meta-analysis is an analysis of analyses. I don't have too much use for this. I used to, we used to make jokes about it. Metadigestion is a cannibal eating someone who's just had a full meal, right? I don't know. It's not, that's supposed to be a joke. The only meta I really have, I'm very enthusiastic about is metamucil, but that's a different topic, all right? Okay, so they say you have to be aware of your own cognitive processes. It's the ability to self-regulate, to use self-regulatory mechanisms. And so, I mean, so for instance, they say, look, effective learners are aware of what works for them, okay? They know good strategies and not such good strategies. They know it's, and if you tell, and you should tell them, if I give you a strategy that doesn't work, blow it off. Who knows how to say the word elephant in Hebrew? On the count of three, everyone say it. One, two, three. Eel. Y'all remembered. How many people remembered it by imagining peeling an elephant because it has loose skin. One person. That surprised me. A lot of people liked that. I saw in this class it didn't. How many people saw an elephant slipping on a banana peel? One person. A lot of people do that. Do it that way. On the count of three, if you didn't know how to say duck in Spanish before you got into this class, if you knew how, you're not allowed to say anything. How do you say duck in Spanish? One, two, three. Pato. Pato. Just about everybody said it. How did you remember? Who saw a pot on a duck's head? That's the way I do it. No? How many people saw a duck cooking in a pot? Raise your hand. Admit the truth. Oh, only two, only two gourmets in here, right? <laughs> okay. What else do people do? What else can you do? I can't even, how else did you remember? Go ahead. Pate. Pate. You make pate out of goose livers. Same thing to me. Same thing. <laughs> said same thing to me. Definitely not a gourmet, okay? Have to be careful. You know, if he had said that to me, I would have been hopelessly confused. I would have thought pato meant goose in Spanish. I would have been shot. If it works for him, it works. Who else remembered? How else did, else did you remember? Who else wants to tell me how you remembered? Nobody? How many remember Pate? Nah, I don't know. Okay. 
Some of you may remember because I said it 5,000 times, but I don't know. How many people knew already when you came in here? No, oh, about seven or eight. All right. So, but you have to be aware of what works for you, making strategies. Well, for instance, I at some point developed a keen awareness that spelling, what worked for me, was doing the word syllable by syllable. And I would, and I obviously rejected together, and I would reject strategies, even like to get her, that's a great one. You go to get her, you're together. I would reject them because it would screw up my system. Something screws up the system, get rid of it, okay? <laughs> And if you find a kid rejecting what you're doing because the kid has a system that works, leave him or her alone as long as it works, okay? And it gets you where you want to go, okay? The second thing is, let's go back in here. Effective learners engage in strategies that help them learn. So they know that they need to make strategies. They monitor their own learning. In other words, they self-regulate. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about self-regulation. They self-regulate, okay? First, they set attainable goals. That's the first thing. This is underlined, it's not going anywhere. They set attainable goals. Good learning. What? Say it again? I just, I added this slide, yes. People who are watching this tape in the semester, it's not being recorded, you will see this slide on there. I added this slide recently. I'm always piddling with them, so keep watching. Even if you're taking this three semesters after it was recorded. Okay, good learners set attainable goals. Okay, I just added this recently. Okay, and by the way, this is something you're gonna have to do. Okay, you're gonna have to have the kid have attainable goals and they know I can't do it. If somebody says to me, okay, you're going to have to now set up a goal to learn, to take a calculus course and learn calculus, which I managed to slip out of, that's a big secret, okay? I, I, I would know not to do it. I'd say I have to start, I have to review some algebra and trigonometry first, because I forgot that, that's stuff I did take. If somebody says to me, okay, what you're gonna do is I'm gonna give you a book in second year physics. <clears throat> Let's make it second year nuclear physics. Okay, I would know, stop, <laughs> right? There's nothing I can do to learn second year nuclear physics. <laughs> I gotta, First go back and review regular physics, which I haven't taken in 5,000 years, then do first year nuclear physics, and then maybe we'll get to second year. Cut it out. This is one of the grievous problems with standardized tests, okay? I will tell you now, if a kid doesn't really get addition, I don't care how mechanical your strategies are for showing him or her how to multiply, it's not gonna work. The kid first has to understand what multiplication is. It's a fast form of adding a whole bunch, of the same number a whole bunch of times. Seven times seven is seven plus seven. Yeah, but, but, but the tacky test is coming. The kid's got to know this. It doesn't help. Just makes the kid miserable, and he's not going to pass the tacky test anyway. All right? The next thing is, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Whoops, I messed up here again. Uh, machine, by the way, even though I don't think people are machines, and that's why I don't like this, machines hate me. Even though this is a theory based on machines, machines really hate me, so I want you to know. Self-assessment. You have to determine what is needed in order to reach your goal. Kids, this can be difficult. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to set attainable goals for kids, and you're going to have to determine what they need in order to reach their goals. This is often not very easy. Kids who can already do this usually have the cognitive ability to understand what they need. But you have to, you have to do things, and often we will get ourselves off on weird tracks. Right? For instance, there are, there are alphabets. The Hebrew alphabet, for instance, the name of the letter is the sound of the letter, the first sound in the letter. So bet is a b, dalit is a d, kuf is a k, you get it? And there are endless things where you're trying to get the kid to remember the names of the letter, right? Well, I, I was in a school once, since I was a master student, and there's a kid, he could go, oh, this is, this is a, this is a g, and this is a p, and this is a t, and this is a f, but he couldn't remember the names of the letters. And you'd show the kid the word and he'd go peel. 
he'd sound it out, even though he didn't know the names of the letters they had to put in the law, right? So finally I said to the teacher, what do you give a damn? Practically in those words. You're a, the, the idea was that the strategy of knowing the names of the letters would immediately give you a hint for the sound, right? But just say the letter, you can hear the first sound. So the kid knows the sounds. Leave the letter names alone. Right? Kid was in second grade. I, you'll teach him that in the third grade, in the fourth grade, whatever. I mean, he's got to know the name. I said, that's fine. But that's a separate goal, knowing the names of the letters. The goal is to read. If you're going to teach the kids, if you have a strategy to teach the kid the sound of the letter, the kids already knows the sound of the letters from a different strategy, whatever. The, I don't know how he did it. It was a boy. Leave him alone. So, to, so we get obsessed. That's why I have to wonder if a kid is getting 98s and not doing homework, why does the kid have to do the homework? If a kid's getting 98s on all the tests without doing the homework, the kid has made a self-assessment, said, I don't need to do the homework to learn this stuff. I'm not doing it. It's a waste of my time. How many people think that's a good self-assessment? How many people think you should make the kid do the homework anyway? We're taking a vote. Everyone has to vote. Vote out there. Who thinks that you should tell the kid, never mind, you don't have to do the homework? Who thinks that the kid should have to do the homework anyway? Why? It's building strategies for the future, but it's also teaching them personal discipline and taking um, and participating in okay. what the class is Are doing. Are you ready then to tell the kids' parents, I am giving your kid homework, not because it teaches her anything, but because she has to learn personal discipline. Are you ready to do that? It's saying, I am making kids do hours and hours of work they know already for personal discipline. If you are, that's fine. But you've got to be honest. I'm going to be an art teacher. I don't think this can be a problem. I got it. Who else thinks yes? Why? Push it down, push it down. For basically the same reason. Just to, to, even in life, if you're good at something, you still have to, at work, you still have to do the, th the filing over and over again, even if you're perfect at it. No, but there's a reason for the filing. Well, there's a reason for homework, too. Which is? To get better at it. But this kid doesn't need to do it. The kid's getting 98s on all the tests. 98 isn't perfect. There's still room for improvement. But maybe it's short-term memory, so that's why he's doing it. Like he does. Short-term memory. Well, well, if you're going to do the homework on Tuesday and have the test on Thursday, it's not short-term memory, right? Short-term memory is right on the spot, right? Which you know, go ahead. It's better have two strategies than one. Say it again, a little louder. It's better to have two than one. One doesn't work for something. Yeah, but the kid obviously has made an assessment. He doesn't need to do it. St homework, by the way, is not a very effective learning strategy. Either the kid goes home and practices what he already knows, or he go home, goes home and makes the mistakes he's already been making. He's always been making, right? It's not a very effective. But I mean, at least to be honest, why you're doing it. By the way, there are plenty of teachers who say, "Okay, if you get 95 or high on the test, you don't have to do the homework. <laughs> if you don't, you do." I don't have too much weeks for homework, that's something else. But at least you should self-assess. Then, next project, next process, is self-judgment. You have to determine whether your learning strategies are succeeding. By the way, this all applies for teaching strategies, too, in case you're interested. Is my strategy for getting the kids to learn this working or not? If it's not, don't say, oh, I got to do more of it. Say, I got to stop doing it and find something else like those flashcards. Burn them. And finally, and this is about the only place that I can find that there are any emotions in this theory at all, be aware of how you feel about the process. How do I feel? Am I confident? If you have a strategy that seems to be working, but you got a bad feeling about it, you may think it's not so hot. You may say, hmm. And by the way, if a kid has a strategy that's working and feels good about it, but you know it's not good for the future, you have to tell him or her. Dr. Gay, who teach, he teaches with me, he got 100 on one test by doing something the wrong way. Right? It was a different way. Come back to me. Then he figured out. It was a different way that he figured out. 
And this just gave him a 50. He said, why? I got all the right answers. He said, finally, he found out because the next step in the process, you couldn't use his way. You had to use her way, right? That often happens in math. You can brain your way through something, you have a strategy, but the next part, it won't work. He said, why didn't she tell me? All she had to do was tell him. He remembers this from eighth grade. He just told me that story twice already. He gets so angry. We go out to lunch and drive him back. He got upset, right? I mean, now we're not upset anymore, but... So you have to be certain that you understand, you know, this is going to, and if a kid is using a strategy that's not effective, say, here, look, it's not going to work the next step. Why don't you try this one? Okay? But th you have to have a sense that I'm being effective, and the kids need to have the sense I'm being effective in what I'm doing. Okay, now, I have 20 minutes to go on a tirade, tirade, and I may do, or we may start on Piaget. Okay, look. Learning theories are the theories that overwhelm and dominate education. But they leave, they have a lot of problems, both philosophically and empirically. What, what happens? Okay. Let me get two people here. Let me make it real. Come over here. Come over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you looking? Okay. How tall are you? Five feet. Who's taller than five feet? Who's substantially taller than five? Here, come over here. Here we go. Name? Lynn. Lynn? Becky. Becky. Okay. Stand next to her. Okay, we're going to take a vote. I'm now going to give you a piece of information. Lynn is Becky's mother. How many people think that Lynn is older? How many people think that Becky's older? How many people think you can't tell? Who thinks Lynn is older? Lynn is Becky's mother. She's her mother. Who do you think is older? <laughs> Anybody think that, that Becky's older that you can't tell? All right. If I had a bunch of four-year-olds in here, 90-something percent of them would say Becky's older because she's taller. taller, bigger, or bigger. Taller or bigger, that's right. A couple times I've seen it the other way around. Once I was standing next to someone, <clears throat> um, this was many, many years ago, and I was substantially taller than he was. We asked a kid, uh, who's older? He points to the other one. Can you tell who's older? He said, yeah, he is. I said, how can you tell? He said, I said, really? I was stunned. I said, how can you tell? I said, he's my father. I, and I didn't say that. I just said, can you tell who's older? He said, yeah. yeah. I said, he says, he has white hair. In those days, I didn't. This was 30-something years ago, right? In those days, I didn't. Okay, so in the end... It was one, it, we have one way to judge, okay, he's older. Okay, so thank you very much, give him a big hand. So, learning theory has a very, very difficult time explaining that. How are you going to explain the way little kids think? Who ever taught them that? Did I tell you about the desserts with my kids? I don't think I did. <sighs> my two sons. This was my two. Uh, I was, right, I'm feeding two of my sons, right? There were only two I had at the time. So I think one was seven and five. I can't remember. So you know how it is, you gotta eat, you gotta finish, finish your vegetables, and you can have dessert. So you know, the vegetables, I finally found a flower pot where they dumped all the vegetables, right? <laughs> on the floor, in your shirt, on the flower pot, pfft, all over. okay, vegetables are gone. <laughs> dessert time. <laughs> so I do this for a living like a dope. I didn't look, I reach in, pat out a cookie, give it to the older one, I reach for the other one, oh, oh there's one cookie left and it's broken. Oh no, Lord help me. 
I had the other one in front of the other one. It was on his plate, even though he didn't have it yet. But I see it's a perfect crack. So I reach in with two hands. I put it together, right? <laughs> Couldn't tell. Put it in the plate. Hold it together on the plate like this and give it to the younger one. Just like out of a bad movie. It goes like this. <laughs> he has a big one. I have two little ones. <laughs> I said... No, no, it's the same. It's not the same. Put it together. No, it's not the same. He has a big one. I have two little ones. So I took the other one. Come on, give him yours. You know it's the same. He's going to it's not the same. He says, no, no, no. He's a baby. I'm not giving that baby my cookie. So please give him. No, he's a baby. I'm begging you. I'm begging. All right, you baby, take the cookie. I'm not a baby, right? So, You ever sometimes feel that the forces of the universe are out to get you? Less than a month later, you know, Kit Kats, they come into strips, right? Same thing, the vegetables all over the floor in their hairs, all gone. All right, here we go. Kit Kats, I have two strips left. This time I'm thinking. I feel one is holding the other one smashed to pieces. I pull them apart. I take the whole one, I give it to the younger one, and I take the one that's smashed, I give it to the older one, right? So they're both ripping, they're opening it, and the older one feels that it's, that it's smashed, right? So he takes it and he dumps it in his plate. The young one says, he has a billion, I only have one! <laughs> I remember you used the word billion. <laughs> Before I could say anything, I'm going to move. You ready? <laughs> Before I could say anything, the older one gets up like this. He grabs the plate, and he st I turned it, right, and he's stuffing the stuff in his mouth. And, one out in the yard, and he ran to the yard, going, no, 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 no. He's stuffing his mouth and running out the door screaming. And the other one's shrieking. And he had a I said, don't worry. I'm smart. Don't worry. I said, don't worry. I'll make yours as much as his. He said, okay. So I take it and I smash it up. No, he had more because the other one's in the yard eating his. I can't. I finally got it down to molecular sized pieces, right? No, no, he had more. He had more. So here's what learning theorists are going to have to tell you that something in the environment reinforced the younger one to think that if you break something into two pieces, you get less. But if you break it up into many, many, many pieces, you get more. And something in the environment reinforced the older one to say the most poor, important interpersonal reaction you can have with your brother is to torture him <laughs> at all costs, right? Whenever possible. He knew it was the same, right? Learning theory has a very difficult time accounting for the strategies for, for the thinking of young children. On top of that, information, it, it, it just has a very difficult time doing that. Information processing theory, which is almost devoid of emotion, except for this idea about regulating your feelings about your theories, it's devoid of emotion. But, but thinking is loaded with emotion. Indeed, the fact that it sees human cognition as being machine-like takes away much of what people have recognized for a long time as being crucial to human thinking. Interest, insight, seeing ideas and patterns. So you have, you have machines that play chess, chess at the highest levels. There's even was a machine that beat a grandmaster once, although the world chess champ, although he panicked because it made such, it made a move that was offbeat. But it was, they're not quite that good. But they can beat 99% of the chess players in the world. But they don't play chess like a human being. They don't see insights, they don't see threat, right? They do, they use probabilistic measures and they use patterns, but not insights of looking at the whole board in a way. Just because two people come up, a machine comes up with an answer, a human comes up with the answer, doesn't mean the machine is a model for human thinking. Furthermore, furthermore, the information processing people give away what the game is here. For learning theorists, under, knowing, knowing boils down 
to memorizing stuff, learning stuff, patterns on stuff, rather than thinking. So there's really no emotion there. Insights, understandings, interest. It's a, it's, I mean, it's a information processing theory. I'll say it right out if people want to write to me letters, write me letters. It's a dehumanizing way to look at human beings. On top of that, it assumes that all knowing is memorizing material. So you have to ask yourself, where does creativity come from? If you were told to set goals for the classroom, if people had said, we're not going to let Beethoven do anything except learn the goals that we set for him, where would the music revolution that he made, which let the classical music have come from? Where do new ideas come from? Where do new thoughts come from? Where do, different, where do new insights come from? Where does looking at the same material and getting different thoughts come from? And there are people who are going to tell you that understanding and emotions are the crux of what being a human being is, the crux of learning and knowing, and the crux of what teaching ought to be about. Piaget, whom we're going to do next, is going to tell you, look, knowing isn't only learning more, okay, it's also understanding better. Learning is also, un it's, it's understanding better. And incidentally, Piaget is going to be able to tell us why little kids think the way they do. And this becomes super crucial. Because for a kid who thinks that if you break a cookie in two, you have less, but if you break it into dozens and dozens of pieces, you have more, that is a way of understanding the world that makes it, at this point, really a waste of time or worse to try to teach him how to add. He doesn't understand what a quantity it is, what numbers are. Hierarchies are not a matter of learning stuff. Hierarchies are a way of looking at things. If you can't understand the nature of time, then you can give a ridiculous answer like, oh, she's older than her mother. But she's taller. That's, that just doesn't make sense. And it, learning theories, ultimately learning theories will tell you all you are is shaped by your environment. When you see kids who are clearly not shaped by their environment, four-year-olds, five-year-olds, six-year-olds, seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, clearly think things that are contradictory to the way adults do, that clearly got contradictory to the way the environment really functions, at least from our perspective, then you got troubles. Then you're going to have to look at things differently. And you're going to have to ask yourself, can I teach the kid this if the kid can't understand what I'm talking about because he or she understands the environment in a different way? All right, I'm going to start. I've got a few minutes. So we're going to talk now. Wait, whoops. The person we're going to start with is, there we go. Let's go to PowerPoint. Is Jean Piaget. There he is. Okay, notice I couldn't quite snip off the bottom of the picture there. Famous Swiss psychologist. And Piaget was a constructivist. He's known as a... He's from the school of French constructivism, even though he wasn't from France. He's French, okay? And he said, look, in the end, in the end, all of these learning theories are, I mean, he didn't say in these words, but this is his contention, are mechanistic. They treat people like machines, like computers. Or Skinner and Benduria basically, Skinner basically teaches people like a videotape recorder, right? You put the stuff in, the environment does it, you push the right button, and out comes back what went in. Bandura has some of that, not completely. 
By the way, when Piaget wrote this, Bendura's theory became closer and closer to Piaget's, as though he still wouldn't acknowledge stages. But Piaget said, uh-uh, I'm going to take an organismic approach. Human beings are living organisms. If you want to understand how human beings function, you don't go to a machine like a computer. You have to understand the processes of living organisms and how they function. And he said, all living things develop. Okay? And when they develop, they change quantitatively. A caterpillar, a butterfly is not more and more and more and more and more and more and more caterpillar. It's fundamentally different. Okay? When a human being reaches puberty, it's not more and more pubescence. It's a fundamental change. Okay? Living things develop. They change qualitatively. They're qualitative change in the way living things are, not just quantitative changes. As you grow, you don't just become taller. There are fundamental changes that take place in your anatomy that are fundamentally different. Puberty is the most obvious one. And Piaget said, my theory is a theory of genetic epistemology. All right, let's see. I know a lot of you copied the notes, but let's see. What does the term genetic mean? Don't look at the notes. Tell me from your own heads. What does genetic mean? Go ahead. Of or relating to genes? Genes, relating to genes, relating to biology. That's one thing it means. It means something else, too. Anybody ever read the Bible? Who read the Bible? Raise your hand. Good. What's the name of the first book? Genesis. Genesis. It's the same rule. What does Genesis mean? Push it down. Somebody say, right, beginnings. So he says, I'm going to talk about the biology or the genes, the biological beginnings or the biological roots and epistemology. Here, come, come, to, the, come to the PowerPoint. I'm going to talk about the biological roots. Epistemology is the branch of philosophy that talks about how we know what we know the biological roots of intelligence. That's what my theory is, the biological roots of intelligence. For many years, until he frankly got past 70 where he sort of gave in because he got old, he refused to call himself a psychologist because the truth is you will see, and this is a, a lack in the theory, it doesn't talk about human differences. He doesn't talk about differences. He's looking for that which is common to the development of human intelligence. And let me just do this. Piaget has a fundamentally different approach to knowledge. I know this is hard to see. The person, my PowerPoint teacher, she's on the faculty now, Dr. Thompson. Anybody take a course from her? Screams at me every time I see this, this thing. Okay, learning approaches to knowledge are, have a reductionist view of knowledge. The whole can be broken down to its parts without losing its meaning. And the parts equal the sum of the whole. Okay, we're going to end with a little, who can, um, okay, how many people believe the whole is equal to the sum of its parts? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's not? Okay, ready? Hydrogen. Somebody tell me something about hydrogen gas at room temperature. It's a gas that? Explodes. That what? Explodes. It burns like crazy. And oxygen is a gas. Fuels chemical reactions. Yeah, it, it, it aids chemical reactions in turning, com including combustion. So hydrogen is a gas that burns like crazy. Oxygen is a gas that, caught, that aids combustion. Oh, I got an idea. Come, come over here. Let's go to the, let's go to the, over, the, the tablet. I'm going to, I really want it to burn. I'm going to combine it, and I'm going to get a gas that burns like hell. Uh, no, I don't think so. You're going to get a liquid that puts out fires. <laughs> so the whole doesn't always equal to the sum of its parts. It depends how they come together. And by the way, does anybody know what this is? H2O2. No, this is water. This is hydrogen peroxide. It has very different properties from water, one of which is... If you spill water on you, it feels good. If you spill hydrogen oxide on you, you will, uh, if you spill it on you, you will, uh, 
lose all your skin, right down to the arm, the arm, right? Okay, next time we'll go further into Piaget's theory.